These have been in place long enough up front. We want to talk about the corn market. This is the last one of the day. We have uh, uh, four folks up here that are really important to us. Pete Manhart is with us. He's with Bates Commodities out of Normal, Illinois. Joins us on Monday mornings. Pete's been with us for a long time, one of the old I, steadfast. I Paul Bates. And he, yes, <laughs> and, and he, he did. Uh, he replaced Paul Bates. Paul was one of the first ones that retired. I've been around at the radio station since the programming that uh, currently airs was developed. In fact, I was a student in 1985 when uh, Charlie Lindy and Paul Bates and well, Paul Cooley doesn't see, he's leaning back there talking to somebody, but Paul Cooley was there and they really decided all together how to put this program together and Mr. Bates did a great job with it and he was a big supporter of the university and a great supporter of the station. We're awfully glad to have you, Pete Manhart, with us too today. Next to Pete is Bill Gentry. He's with Risk Management Commodities out of Lafayette, Indiana. Joins us on Wednesday mornings to talk about the marketplace and Jackie Vakes is with us from Stuart Peterson. She's out of Champaign County, lives not very far from me. Uh, for those of you who have talked to me and know that I walk every day, I walk by Jackie's house a lot. Um, I walk by a lot of people's houses a lot, frankly, but I always have headphones in, so I never pay too much attention. Uh, and Dan Zwicker is on the end, and apparently he has adopted the Louisiana dress code for the day. <laughs> That's a Texas dress code. What is that, Duck Dynasty? What do you got going on there, uh, That's East Texas, too. Oh, yeah, East Texas. Say. He's ready to go. And yes. what are, All right, Dan, I'm going to start with you. I want you to lay out. You know what, because I think, I think you can do both of these for corn. Lay out both a bullish and a bearish scenario. But I don't, know, I don't want to know which one you are yet. You don't know what Zwicker is? <laughs> <laughs> I know what Zwicker is, but that's the beside the point. Texan. He's an East Texan. <laughs> well, the first uh, one comment I want to make, and this is going to be probably a little wild, um, as some people thought I was a lunatic when I was talking about a fall rally, so I guess I'll keep that lunatic uh, coined is that I'm not too sure that we haven't been going through the 30s depression over the past five or six years. It's just that it looks different. Uh, in the 30s, you had the soup lines. The soup lines have been replaced by food stamps. In the 30s, you had people standing on corner blocks hunting for jobs, unemployment, insurance, welfare payments, um, that kind of replaced that. And um, so it's camouflage compared to what it was in the 30s because of all of our safety nets. And if, if that is an idea, if that's somewhat in the cards, I kind of think we're starting to come out of the depression uh, but I really don't know how we're going to come out of it. But, uh, you know, the Depression, we came out of the 30s Depression because of World War II. And, <clears throat> but somewhere along the line here is that the economy is beginning to show signs of strengthening. Now, as soon as we see a positive sign, we see a negative sign. But, uh, uh, I think the Fed's going to have another round of quantitative easing, uh, so I think we're going to print more dollars. Um, I think overall, around the world, in each country, I think the central banks are going to have problems, people having faith in their ability to control the economy and paper dollars, because basically that paper dollar is all about confidence in your government. Yeah. If you lose confidence in your government, that paper bill is absolutely worthless just like it is. Next step here, uh, I'm going to take the, like I uh, started off with my quote, actually I'm a Texan, I ride bulls, so I'm going to ride a bull here in corn for a minute. I look at the move out of the 05 low uh, and the low that we saw last fall at 318 as of completed three waves to the top ABC correction Elliott wave. 
We had the, the first high uh, in 07 or 08, and then we uh, had one there in 10, and then we had another one uh, in 12. Uh, the decline off of the 12 high down to the 406 low, which was done a year ago harvest, was A, the rally last spring uh, to 518 or 519 was B, and the decline down to uh, 318 was C. So I think from an Elliott Wave perspective, uh, the corn market has completed uh, three drives to the top and an ABC correction, and we're in the early stages of a bull market. For those of you that uh, followed us many, many moons ago when I was a young buck uh, driving a 1983-944, remember me talking about 27-year cycle lows. Um, and we had a low in 1960, and then we had, uh, we in AgriVisor kind of got famous as being the big bears because we were talking about prices going into a mid-80s low because of that 27-year cycle. And we went into the mid-80s low, and if you count out of the mid-80s and count 27 years out, we're here. So I think we uh, are at a 27-year cycle low in commodities. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think we're coming out of the depression. And uh, <clears throat> from my cyclical point of view, um, I view that we've got an upturn in the 54, 55 month cycle uh, that's in play, uh, and that should lift us higher over the next uh, two to three years. Is that enough for you, Todd? <laughs> I guess we're not getting a bearish one from you. <laughs> Although, there are times when the market turns down, and you already explained those. And if I remember Elliot's, uh, Elliot Waves correctly, uh, we've done three, you said, but there are five, right? Well, there's five waves, but that's three drives. Yeah, you've got, we've done Up, three, down. Of, three of five, we've done three We've of had the five, five drives. ways up, or the five, it's a five count, but it's, it's a three five drives count. to the top. First, first Th is oh. one, down is two, three, four, five, three drives to the top. Right. Wait, so you gave us all three drives. And then we have an A, B, C correction. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's crayons. <laughs> no, I understand what he's <laughs> telling me. I'm just thinking about what that means. Yes. Start of a bull market. Okay, this so time you, I'm going to back it up. All right. I'm not going to let him talk the rest of the time. So. <laughs> I'll shut up after this. But <laughs> over the last few years, we've had record record yields with years ending in four. So if you go back to 1994. Get this Bates Commodities. I'm promoting Bates Commodities here today. <laughs> and Bates Commodities. Wait, did he buy into your? <laughs> we paid Bates him yesterday with a candy bar. Quite a man table on everybody's deal. You go back to 1994-95 when we had a record yield of 138.6, and we came off of a 1993 flood that basically the state of Iowa didn't hardly grow anything. Right. The following year, we dropped back to 113 bushels per acre. That was an 18 percent drop off of that spike. Remember, 138 or 139 was a major spike up in corn yields at that time. Okay, you go over to 2004, 2005. In 2003, 4, we had 142. We spiked up to 160, and then we fell back to 148. Not as, as severe drop, but it was an 8% drop. So, if you say the range is between an 8 to 18% drop from 171, our yield this year is going to be between 140 and 157. Hmm. Well, that'll make you bullish. <laughs> yeah. That'll make you bullish. On the other hand, Jackie Bakes, <coughs> the national average yield is much higher than that. 
uh, depending on who you're listening to, somewhere in that 165, 66, 67. Well, Scott, Scott, Scott Irwin said we have a 50% chance of being between 160 and 170 in the report that he put out. Right. 11% below 150 and 22 above 170. So where are we? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective. So, it, you know, it lies, our, our greatest opportunities are between 160 and 170. But, you know, if, if you look at the, at the marketplace, you know, and if we're going to talk bullish bearish, sure. you know, um, crude oil prices, we all know what's happening with crude oil prices, okay? It's, it's killing the frackers. There's no question about that. At the same time, it's putting more disposable income in, you know, into people's pockets. Uh, as long as the U.S. dollar remains higher, I think we're going to see less South American corn production. And I'll, and I'll back that up by saying that we had an Argentinian that came into uh, the Ag Forum and he laid out how a bean farmer decides whether he's going to plant beans or whether he's going to plant corn. And he said basically because of the tax situation they have, the exchange rate situation that they have, and they are, they are paid based on U.S. dollars, but they are paid in their local currency because it is against the law to be paid in any foreign currency. Because then, and $10, this is the way he laid it out. He said $10 at the CME, $3.75 gone for export tax, $3 gone for exchange rate. Com the, the government makes a lot of money on that. About 25 cents gone to the, gone to the elevator. So it leaves, the, it leaves the guy about three bucks. Then he's gotta pay real estate taxes or he's gotta pay you know, his uh, everything else. And by the time you get to the bottom, that $3 gross is what he's got left to, to pay his inputs, to pay everything else right down the line, including real estate tax and landlord. And so he said what they do is they look at the, uh, the May contract, and if you look at the May contract for 16 right now on both corn and beans, take it times 25%. That's what they're looking at as a potential gross coming back to them. Corn is at $1.07, beans are at two forty-five. They're gonna plant beans. And so I think we're going to see a switch in South America as long as the dollar stays higher. Granted, the dollar being higher hurts us from an export standpoint, and yet on, on the other side it kind of helps us because it takes some of our competitors out of the marketplace. At the same time, you've got live cattle uh, numbers. You heard Chris Hurd talk this morning. Live cattle numbers are growing. Oh, hog farm, hog numbers are growing like you can't believe. Uh, milk production and expansion of dairy cows growing dramatically, those are all positive things for us on the corn side of things. And I think that they could support a better marketplace. What are some of the things that make it dangerous to us? Well, if you looked at the hedge funds this week, just last week alone, they dropped 130 million egg contracts out of their portfolio, one week. Why is that? Well, if you look at what happened, you know, you look at the Dow. The Dow is in its sixth year of increases, okay? We've only had two times in the last hundred years that, another, that the Dow has made it through the seventh year without failing, okay? But what happened was as the Dow was falling and things were going to pieces during this recession area, uh, a lot of these guys had to come to us to hedge their portfolio. They would buy, they would buy ag commodities as a hedge it's beginning to shift the other way again, and we're starting to see them pull some of that hedge because they don't necessarily need it as much. That's dangerous to us as far as I'm concerned. Um, you, you know, you talked about, uh, Dan talked, you look at the world economies, that, that just scares a person to death. There are 14 central banks right now doing quantitative easing. That's not a good thing for us. And I think one of the biggest uh, terrors is the euro, you know, and what can happen over there, and that definitely has uh, an impact on us. Um, job openings at this point in time you know you look at the you know you you, you know we're impro we're improving right but job openings right now are at a 14 year high because people don't want to work we have so many people right now that are <coughs> between the ages of 16 and 26 the unemployment rate they start figuring it out at 16 the unemployment rate has almost doubled in the last 3 years and you know that those are our prime work people basically is what it is. And so I think, you know, we have to look at the, the big picture. And I think the biggest danger to us is China back in 2011, um, they put in price supports to keep their farmers from migrating into the cities, okay? But they put them in in 2011. Remember where prices were back then? Uh, they're not anywhere close to that now. So why do we have such tremendous demand out of them? It's because they keep supporting their farmer at this high price. Do you think a manufacturer is gonna buy from them at the high price? 
when they can get it from us and ship it for cheaper than what their price is? Not at all. So this is going to come to an end, whether it's this next year. It's going to come to an end sometime. Actually, what they've been talking about, when I was at Ag Forum, I talked to a guy who I consider to be an expert on China, and he said they're thinking about doing transition payments like we used to have. So what could happen to our market? That's the scary part. So I, th I think what it comes down to, no matter how you look at it, it's all about managing your risk. It's not about hoping the market's going to go higher. It's about being afraid it's going to go lower and knowing what your costs are and managing that risk. And so uh, we can make, you can make arguments a hundred different ways, I think, on either side pretty much, but it still comes down to the bottom line and is that <coughs> saving the equity you've earned over these last number of years when we've had these high prices and over your whole lifetime in farming. That's what it's all about. Okay, I'm gonna pull you, but I only need, uh, which direction do you think this is gonna be? Uh, are you <coughs> bullish or bullish friendly or bearish the bean market? And I, I'm working at something else for an answer, so Dan, bullish, bearish, I gotta friendly. be bullish the beans. Bullish beans? I'd have to say I'm, I'm neutral beans. Neutral? Neutral bearish. Neutral to bearish. Neutral to bearish. Neutral beans. to bearish beans. Okay. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the corn to bean ratio um, with you, uh, Bill, just, just to begin I just with. got ready to answer the question you asked those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the question I asked those guys. Give me a profitable and a, and a price positive. Oh, the, oh well, okay. Well, I'm good with that. You've been thinking about it for a while. Well, I, I think a couple things is when you put together a marketing plan, one of the things we work really hard on is putting out a, you know, a six-week, eight-week, 12-week window of opportunity and then realizing what prices you're going to market against. One of the prices or one of the costs you know is what your cost of production is based on, let's say, a five-year yield. And then you know what would offer you a profit and a reasonable standard of living and then what percentage of your crop you're going to need to market in those price ranges in order to have an, an effective income. So laying the groundwork right now is not necessarily a bullish or a bearish scenario, but knowing what those price ranges are and the tools that you want to use in order to capture that. So I'd say going forward, you know, when, when we look at a situation with right this is we got a pretty decent demand base overall with corn that's probably not going to shift much and as chris said this morning our livestock is probably going to come to us we do have some currency concerns so our exports might be a little shaky at times uh, but at the end of the day uh, the quantity demanded might change a little bit but the demand is probably going to be the same way with the, when it comes to currency issues so all the things considered i'd say the bearish scenario is now, if the dollar does go higher and we get big acres at the end of the month or through the production season at a good yield, uh, and on top of that have a lot of corn in the bin right this minute that has not been moved by early summer, that's going to be a price negative scenario because what we're worried about is the compression of two marketing years coming to the market at the same time. Yeah. Uh, a price friendly scenario uh, would be maybe a, a slower start to the spring. You know, we've had really cold temperatures. The ground's not warming up like we would like. Uh, there's still time, but uh, if things do happen to go slow and we stay a little cooler than we want, we don't get the jump on our tillage work, fertilizers, get things planted like we're seeing in the south already, uh, then that's going to basically to maybe trim some of our yield prospects off, maybe trim some of our acres off, uh, and then open up our upside potentials. Does that make us wildly bullish? No. But it does give you an opportunity to maybe sell at some of those higher prices early that are going to make you make your income statement work for you, which this year we're working with a compressed situation. You're not going to get those really high highs probably to market into and cross our fingers. We won't have those really low lows that we've thought about in the past. But right this minute, you know, the friendly scenario would be, you know, maybe some reduced acres, maybe a little bit of slow start to the year, uh, and maybe not the ideal yields and not trimming off our demand base like some people think we might. Uh, the bearish scenario, probably most importantly, is seeing two years of crop getting marketed in a 60-day period, which would be, you know, mid to late summer, where the guys realize I got a great yield that I still got the, uh, my bins are full. That would be a T-bone that we just can't afford. Hmm. Pete, do you want to build a bullish and a bearish scenario too? Sure. Uh, when's the last time? Where was the U.S. dollar at the last time we had corn eyes back in 2008? It was about 120 or higher. Just because the dollar is going up doesn't mean our prices are going to go down. The dollar was at one of its highs the last time we had the highest corn prices ever. So that's something that we can shoot a hole through that doesn't have to happen. We have great usage of corn. The problem is we got a lot of it laying around. I would be 
if you want to stay long corn, I would literally be dumping old crop, buying a cheap July call if you think it's going to go up. But I'd dump it now instead of waiting for it to go down. If I hold the corn, I would protect the bottom against all this corn coming in there. But usage is really good. If we do have a wet spring and we have acres that are smaller, that's bullish to the high side. Now, what's bullish? Uh, to me, right now, we've been in about a 25 cent range for the last how long? You know, 405 to 425. I think 450 is bullish and 390 is bearish. I don't see us going to 318, but I don't see us going to $5 either. I think we're sideways and we have to take advantage of bounces. We kept hearing about this 15, 25 cent bounce of, uh, this morning. What if that doesn't happen? Greg doesn't want you to say that belongs yeah, Greg. to him. <laughs> well, whose bank was that at? No. <laughs> that was one no, point. I think we got a chance at corn. I'm neutral to bullish corn right now on new crop. But old crop, I can't feel very comfortable with because we got so much of it around here. And South America, even though they planted more beans and less corn, have a great corn crop coming on also. They're, what, 85% done planting, which is way ahead of normal for their corn crop. Dan, I want you to take up the corn to bean ratio, how it might, could change, um, what it is currently, where it normally is, and what you think it might be. Well, uh, I wish I probably would have brought a chart, uh, all my stuff's on PowerPoints that I've been doing the last couple of weeks. But um, the corn soybean ratio kind of follows a five-year cycle uh, favoring corn every five years. And then it moves to the extreme uh, in about two and a half years to favor beans, and then it spends two and a half years coming back down to favor corn. And uh, basically, we've been neutral. Uh, I kind of consider a, a 2 4 to a 2 6 uh, ratio is basically uh, neutral and really doesn't move any acres. I think you got to get uh, the corn soybean ratio. Uh, down into 2.2 two to 1.9 uh, to favor corn, and you need to get it up to 3 to 1 to 3.4 to favor soybeans. Now, we've, we've had a high on soybeans here a year or so ago. So I think we're now in the direction of the corn-soybean ratio of moving toward corn. So I think over the next 12 months, to 18 months, we're going to be that we're going to be back to two to one on corn. Okay, now <clears throat> I guess the question is, and this is kind of the bear part: if corn stays at four dollars and we go to two to one, that means beans are going to float back, to float down to eight. And there's your two to one. But if I could get corn to go to five dollars, and I could get, get beans to go back to ten. It would be easier to get 450 and 9, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like that way. It Great seems question. like it might be easier Great to do question. 450 and 9. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything that I look at in corn, um, you know, um, if I'd be a farmer, I'd probably be dead. I probably would have killed myself with the equipment. Um, but if, if I was going to make decisions, I'd plant all corn. Oh, I'm going to call, start to call you John Bonder. Right? You've been down, you've been living in the South for a while, my yeah, friend. Yeah, you are. Well, we're corn yeah. deficit state. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you're going to notice uh, is sorghum seed. You can't buy a bushel of sorghum seed anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good reason for that. And what you're going to see in the South, I think, you're going to see a lot of corn acres lost to sorghum and soybeans. Uh, so I think the corn acre could be, you know, maybe sneak in much smaller than where everybody thinks. But the problem is, is sorghum is just like corn. It's a yes. feed grain. So yep. you're really not, but Getting looking at the corn balance sheet is going to look pretty tight. But then over, but then the other hand, if you look at sorghum exports, we're exporting twice the sorghum that we did a year ago and have exceeded everybody's expectations simply because China has snuck in yep. and bought sorghum because it was at a cheaper price and they didn't have to deal with the MR-164 issue because there are no GMO products in sorghum. But they fixed that. 
Now they but they now bought it before they fixed it. See, they yeah. had it booked before. Doesn't they mean they're it. going to continue to import sorghum, though. They might. Go uh, back it'll, to it. it'll depend upon the price, mm -hmm. but it, you know it'll have to be competitive. Yeah. You were going to follow up on the corn to bean ratio. Oh sure. Go ahead. I'd be happy to do that. I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> sure, she would. Well. I don't know. You know, it's it's interesting. I always think it's really interesting because we hear so many times, you know, the corn bean ratio indicates we should do this. The corn bean ratio indicates what it really comes down to is what does it cost you in your particular situation and with what your yields are. So uh, I started in 2007. I wrote an Excel spreadsheet, real simple for my clients, just said, let's look at where we're at. And I was up to $200 an acre more to plant corn than beans. And I just used that again this year. I thought, I'm not going to back it off. We'll see once where we're at. So I ran this out of Decatur just the other day. Decatur was a nickel under on beans on basis. It was 18 under on corn. Um, with 60 bushel beans, 200 bushel corn. And you remember, you're $200 more per acre. That's a dollar a bushel you're giving up. Beans kick, uh, corn kicked beans by 25 bucks an acre. Then I ran it up on somebody who's, who's in southern Wisconsin. Beans were 87 under, corn was 47 under. He's got 52 bushel beans and 187 corn. And uh, corn kicked beans right out of the ballpark. And so, you know, it really doesn't, I don't, I don't care what they talk about when it comes to the ratio. The ratio's got to come down to what's going on on your farm, what your production levels are, and what you know as the cost difference between the two. And I agree with Dan 100% on the Milo. I think the south is going to go to a lot more Milo. In fact, at the Ag Forum, that's one of the big things they talked about because there was a whole big hubbub because they put out 10-year projections and they dramatically dropped the, the number of metric tons of corn that were going to ship to China. Uh, and I mean dramatic. And a lot of people were yelling at them about that. And they said that's primarily because they believe that that market is going to stay shifted over to sorghum. That, uh, and therefore, we will see more of these places like the South where it's, it's a good crop to grow down there. Uh, utilizing it. And so I think that you're right. I think we could look tight on the corn balance sheet, but that still isn't necessarily the true picture. Yeah, and I would say that you also have to take into consideration the adjustment in price that we saw just last week in the new crop beans. When you take the market down 30, 50, or 60 cents, uh, that, that entire equation changed dramatically. And you have to, if you did your math prior to last week, the entire the uh, horizon has changed as far as beans are concerned, so you have to go back and look at that. Because most of the guys that we've talked to this week have said, that was a game changer for me. I really don't have the yield punch in beans that I have in corn. I'm going to pull back on my bean ideas uh, and go more towards corn. Also, right on the, the coattails of that discussion is the survey for the end of the month numbers from the USDA is being taken right this minute, if not be almost closed. So there's a question mark as to the validity of those numbers that we see at the end of the month uh, as far as the corn and bean acres. What we see is that really what we're going to get. So what you're really going to need to do is, and I don't want to get to the end of the discussion right here at the very beginning, but realize what is good profitable numbers in your marketing scenario today. What your cost of production is and then put together an idea of how you're going to approach a market that may be give you real profitable opportunities and then take your price below cost of production and say hey I might want to assume a little bit of risk or a little bit of ownership here and go through the marketing year with a fluid or a, a an open choice to say I want to own my crop now I want to sell my crop now and as we heard this morning you're going to see maybe some low prices in June and some higher prices down the road if I get to travel the range of my profitable margin down to my cost of production one or two or possibly even three times during the course of this marketing year, how can I approach that effectively? How can I plan to maybe increase my margins today for the opportunities that may present themselves in May or June or July? Because knowing what you're going to do about that now will help you make the critical choices and execute better down the road. And typically, you get a couple of those choices through the course of a marketing year, and you have to be prepared prepared to execute, especially now that those ranges are probably tighter than they've been over the last three or four years. I have to agree with one of the big things he said. In February, we went up 70 cents on beans. In the first week of March, we dropped 50 of them. Mm -hmm. So that changes attitudes. Yep. My problem I think we have is what's a marketing year? How many of you sold $5 corn for this year? <laughs> yeah. Do you know that a year ago, after this meeting, Corn was over $5 for this year. 
I had guys sell a third of their crop last April for this year, over $5. Marketing year isn't from now until this fall. Marketing year for this year started three years ago. We should be looking besides this year, hopefully you've got half of it sold already in corn and beans, already somewhere, or protected on the downside. If you don't, you haven't been marketing because you could have got $5 a bushel for all of your corn over a year ago. Yeah. You should be looking at 16. If we do have this 25, 40, 50 cent bounce, where does it make 16 corn at? Yeah. I think I had somebody sell 16 corn for 440 in the last month. Wouldn't you like to get 440 for this year's crop that you still have, I mean last year's crop that you still have in the bin? We need to be looking at a marketing year as three years out, not what can we need to do now when the prices are down? And I think the bounce that we can get, yeah, we can get 25 cents maybe, but we had over a dollar higher a year ago on this year's corn crop. Why didn't we take advantage of it? I think that's something we have to change in our brains as far as what's a marketing year. Marketing year is the crop I'm gonna have to sell. I ought to be selling it when it goes over $5 or whatever my mark is where I can be profitable. Sell some. If you're profitable, yeah. sell some. Well, I think one of the things that we have to, to think about, too, as we go along here is that what drove the rally that we had going on in October, November, December? I mean, when you looked at, yes, we had, we had good demand, but what drove the rally? It's because the funds, in general, believed the price was too cheap. They looked at the last three years. They said, this price is too cheap. They continued to buy. They continued to buy. They continued to buy. They don't necessarily buy because of fundamentals. They buy because of the way the market is moving, and they magnify it. And when, when you look at the algorithmic uh, traderings that we have going on now, uh, we did a meeting not long ago with Kevin Van Trump, and he, he had been up to the board, and it was amazing to me. That's why I'm going to share it with you. He said they were following Twitter, and corn was, was mentioned 40 times on Twitter, and the computer took a position. Then when it hit 70 times, the computer took the opposite position. They traded 2,000 contracts in 30 seconds. That's what's going on underneath in this thing. So, you know, be careful on getting attached to the, the movement in the market necessarily reflecting anything when it comes to fundamentals. I, I agree with Pete, you have got to be looking, you know, we have to become more like livestock producers. Livestock producers are never looking at what's happening right now. They're always looking out a year or two in advance because they need to. And I think that's where we are now. We have, we have to be thinking about what's happening uh, this, this, there's too many things in flux in the entire world situation to not be considering doing something. Uh, I think in general, we have a very bright future looking forward. I think it's going to be awesome. I just think we have to get through 15 and 16 <laughs> to find out where we're going because um, they said by 2030 at the Ag Forum we'll have 600 million more families in middle class. 200 million will be in China 200, and 100 million in India and the other will come from everywhere else. What's that? 2030, a lot of all will be gone. <laughs> <laughs> I know some guys that will probably still be sitting on corn. Um, but anyway, um, you know. <laughs> uh, I think when you look at that, uh, what happens when poor people get money? We know that if they, if they raise their income from $1.50 a day to two fifty a day, the first thing they do is eat more protein. I, so, I ask about how many sold $5 corn for this year. How many of you have sold any 16 corn yet? How about 17 corn? You should be looking at that right now. When corn goes above what you can make money at, you should be selling some. And we will have opportunities to get 480 on 16 and 17 corn. If it gets there, will you sell any? I don't know if we can get to five, but Zwicker says we will. And I believe him half the time. <laughs> Well, I'm going to sell mine for five, or I'm going to build me a new bin. Yeah, <laughs> so, I, actually, I, I have ignored you and haven't asked, let you ask questions yet, but I know I've got one here. What's your question? It says it's hard to make a move on 16 and 17 corn without knowing how do you, what How do you was. figure when you're, you're, uh, what your yield is going to be this year? How do you do that for expenses? Use an average. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Well, that's why you're not going to necessarily do it in the cash market. You'd, ha you'd have to use some type of paper that gave you the ability to be able to get out of it in, in case something really, really changed. But, you know, you can look at it from a different perspective, too, when we look at how much we lost on our crop insurance payment this year. Use it as a hedge on your crop insurance. What would be wrong with that? You know, and so it's just a, it's just a different way of looking at it, but they're exactly the same bushels. So it makes it a little easier to do. You have a question? Okay, I got a question. I get very <laughs> upset about it. LBIL never mentions this. I live in Livingston County, on the edge of my county seat, and our roads are posted. Four and a half tons per axle. Yep. I could move a bushel of corn if I wanted to. But I've never heard you mention that. Did anybody hear me say posted on the roads this week? I think so. <laughs> did, did anybody hear me say posted this week? I said it this week on the air. Yeah, back here. I just, I just want proof. <laughs> the answer is I understand that, that you can't move. I, yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> well, the takeaway there is <laughs> he said you can forward prices anyways. <laughs> uh, we've we've yeah. got similar people with varying market conditions, and that's one of the things right. you. Anyway. Oh, you're welcome, Bob. <laughs> hey, Wayne. I was trying to think who did I talk to about that. I think it was Ben Pruce. I was and that was in Iowa. I asked, was talking to him about his posted roads. All right, there you go. Yeah. When he got down to zero, he moved it. I understand, and we understand. I will duly take note. Other questions out here? Yep, back in the back. Anybody want to comment about the Syngenta corn lawsuit? The what? Syngenta the Syngenta corn, corn lawsuit. lawsuit. I just know uh, it is going on. Yeah. Um, Me too. Who's my? How many attorneys are involved? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure they're they're hunting around for the case. Who? Anybody in in the audience uh, willing to speak to that? I can't. No, I can't. Not, and it's because I just don't know. Otherwise, I would. All right. How, how many other varieties do we have being grown right now by companies that are not approved by the World for Trade? Any? Do we have a lot? Any? Does anybody know? I bet there are some out there. Not off the yeah. top of my head. Other questions? You know, Todd, one of the things that we didn't talk about, none, that none of us talked about, that's just really been in the news a great deal in the last week or so is bird flu. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but you know, it had been in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Now it showed up in Minnesota. Yesterday it showed up in Missouri. Those are not good things, and the perception is more dangerous to us than the reality is. You know, it's, they, they, always, they always have the big headlines that say bird flu, blah, 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 and then at the very bottom it says none of this meat is ever going into the, you know, out into the food chain at all. But it's just the headlines. And, the, and even the fact that it has migrated that far south into the United States, I mean, this is the first time we've seen it here. So that's concerning from a uh, consumer side as well as 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 well as a corn consumption side. You're marketers. You hear a rumor that makes corn go up thirty cents. What do you do? You either sell some or protect it. When crops go up above your line where you can make money, sell some, yeah. protect it. One of the things that that you know, Pete said, sell some, and I think it, this goes back to the question that was asked about. Uh, the roads being posted and everything. Please, when you hear us talk about selling, 
we are not limited to just selling in the cash market or just corn that we can haul in. We're talking about potentially using paper if you can't haul it, you know, and there's an opportunity there, uh, you know, using an option, using futures, doing something like that. So I know a lot of times people, when they hear the word sell, they think that we only mean it in the cash market, but that's, that's unfortunately our jargon. We're so used to speaking, we're not saying, well, do puts or do this. And we, and we forget to tell you also, there's no basis on paper sale, no basis. <laughs> Dan, you look like you got a final word for us. Let's uh, do that. Uh, uh, if that's, is that what we're doing here? That's where we're at. Okay. <laughs> I think it's um, time to wrap. Do you think? I think it's time to wrap it up. So let's. Go. Um, we do have a problem with probably farmer ownership of corn. Uh, you guys probably own more than what you would like to be owning at this time of year, and then we have a problem with elevators probably owning more soybeans than that they would like to own. Uh, so um, depending upon how the planting season goes, if everything goes ideal, uh, the market could get pretty heavy pretty quick. So I do want to, uh, even though my technical work and my cyclical work uh, does favor the upside, uh, if things go ideal, um, we, we still have the burden of uh, adequate supplies at the moment and like I said you guys probably own more corn than what you'd like to own and I know the elevator owns more soybeans than they would like to own and it's going to be hard to sell more soybeans in the export market. Everybody's focused uh, in South America at the moment yeah. uh, and um, you know, most elevators have their beans empty by now, and that's not necessarily the case. They, they own more beans than they would like to own. Uh, so uh, be careful. Um, I do think there's rally opportunities out there. If you look at the statistics, and one of the gentlemen on the soybean panel indicated that, you know, uh, on soybeans, you only have probably about 20% of your highs in November soybeans made in the first three or four months of the year. So you have uh, roughly an 80% or 70% chance that you'll have a higher high made in November soybeans as you go forward. Statistically on corn, uh, you December corn makes their high about 35% of the time uh, during the first four months of the year. Uh, so you have a 65% probability of a higher high sometime as you go into the summer. Um, so. You know, watch for opportunities. Uh, I'm, since I'm bullish, I'm big on um, uh, buying puts underneath the market, yeah. maybe selling a call uh, a dollar above on corn because the most bullish that I could be would be probably 520. So if the market would offer me an opportunity uh, <clears throat> to purchase a 420 put and a, a sell a 520 call, I'd probably take them up on that. Uh, and, and soybeans, if the market would offer me an opportunity uh, to sell something 10 plus, buy a $10 put and maybe sell a 11.50 or $12 call, I'd probably do something like that and protect me from the disaster that could happen because of all of this old crop inventory being held into the growing season. Because if everything goes good, there's, there's going to be some problems coming at us. Wide basis levels, and we're going to have a lot of inventory uh, coming at us all at once, yep. and it's not going to be a pretty picture. Dan Zwicker, of course, is with CGB Enterprises. He's out of Mandeville, Louisiana, and a YouTube sensation. You can find him there anytime you'd like. Almost every day of the week, at least the ones he works, or you can listen to him at willag.org. Next to him is Jackie Vakes with Stuart Peterson. Your final words, Jackie. <laughs> Miss Stuart Peterson. Boy, I've never been called that before. A lot of other things. Um, First of all, I want to say thank you uh, for having me back again this year. One distinction that I have is I'm the only person on all three panels that can say I got to sit with a bunch of good-looking men, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think that to follow up on what Dan said, I, I couldn't agree more. But uh, open yourself up to looking at short-dated options also. If you're not familiar with those, they have what they call short-dated options that actually 
um, why they call them short dated is because they trade in the, now it will be the May, the July, the August, uh, and, and the different, those different months, and they're based on what new crop does. So if you, you know, if you have a particular bias and you say, okay, I don't want to spend what it costs to go to a full option, perhaps buy a short dated option and maybe sell a, uh, a long dated or a full option well above the money to help pay for it. Uh, the, the one thing I would ask you is this. In your own mind, stop and think. If, if the scenario Dan's talking about, and it's a, it's, it's a possibility that we have a really good spring. I mean, it could happen. We've seen, we've seen the weather turn itself around quickly. Um, do you think the perception at the trade level is going to be that we could have another record year like we had last year? Think there might be that opportunity or that chance? That's what you have to ask yourself because perception is what drives the market. The fundamentals start the market, the fundamentals end the market, and the technicals based on perception is what runs everything in between. So if you're in your own mind, you're looking out the window and you're saying, hmm, you know, this weather's not looking too bad. And we have clients that go all the way across the entire United States, top to bottom and east and west. And I have never, in the 18 years I'm doing this, talked to more people who have barren land that they haven't put fertilizer on, they haven't done anything to, that they still have that ability to make that shift. Um, at the Ag Forum, they said that this is the lowest acres for corn and beans that we've seen since 2011. The expectation was there, that, you know, they talk about it, they, won't, they don't publish it, but they said that corn would probably go up a half million acres, beans would probably go up a half million acres from where it was at their original guess. But you know, it, it still comes down to protecting the bottom line. So thank you again, and thank you to WILL. I have to tell you, I have clients all over. You guys have no idea what a gem you have in WILL. You go to, you go to Iowa, there's nobody that does anything like this. You, you go anywhere else. Uh, I can't believe it. When I go and talk to my guys and I tell them what goes on, they're absolutely flabbergasted. They fight to get information. They mm -hmm. fight for everything. So, you know, really appreciate what they do because they're just the best thing since sliced bread as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much. It's a lot because of that cooperation I talked talked about earlier between the analyst and, and what we do on the air. Really, uh, Dave and I both know the program is not about us. It's about what these guys have to say, and they're the reasons you listen. Are you saying that because he's your neighbor? <laughs> <laughs> well, you mean because my dog barks every time no, he walks past the house? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no I'm, not, I'm not that nice. <laughs> a, final, a final word from you, Bill. Uh, I just thank you all for the opportunity to be out here today, and thank you for coming in, and uh, hope you'll have a real profitable year. And yep. Pete Manhart. Be flexible. Don't get stubborn like I do once in a while. <laughs> My wife says I'm hard-headed. There you go. Don't go anywhere yet. I've got a couple of But, uh, you know, be ready to try something different. If you haven't sold a call or sold a put, try it. See how it works. Don't dive in head first, but try it. See if it can help you in your plan. Know where your price is that you need to sell at or above. And if it goes above it, sell some somewhere. Sell it on the board. You don't have to sell it at the elevator. And again, the board has no, you know, if you sell it at $5, that's what you get. You don't get 30 cents off of it or a nickel above or a nickel below. And thanks to WLL for all their efforts. And thank you, Pete. Thanks to all of the analysts. Don't go anywhere. And to Murray Wise and to Sue Martin and to Chris Hurt and to Jason, who's been behind the board here all day. And Good I don't Jeff. see Jeff there, but Jeff, who's been running uh, the camera, and Les and Heather and Charlie and all the folks that work at WLL.